Many believers understand the power of impartation, and today I want to talk to you about the three different kinds of impartation that will accelerate and increase the power of God on your life. And as we go into what the scripture has to say about this very important topic, I pray that you would come, become a believer who gives impartation, receives impartation, and shares impartation with your fellow believers. Stephen Moctezuma was here with me as usual. He's going to lead you in some worship right now, then we're going to come right back and get into this lesson. The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, they tell me how much you love me. The thorns on your brow, they tell me how you pour so much pain to love me. The nails in your hands, the nails in your feet, they tell me how much you love me. The thorns on your brow, they tell me how. For so much pain to love me, and when the heavens pass away, all your scars will still remain, and forever they will say how much you love me. So I want to say forever my love, forever my heart, forever my life is yours. Forever my love, forever my heart, forever my life is yours. Well, I pray that you enjoyed that worship with Stephen Moctezuma. I know that many of you have written into us while watching YouTube and said that the presence of the Holy Spirit touched you. In fact, we had some commenters say that this was the first time they've ever felt the presence of the Holy Spirit manifested around them while watching a YouTube video. So I really believe that as you engage with this content, that God's not only going to touch you, He's going to speak to you, He's going to transform you. And I truly believe that you're going to be drawn closer to the presence of the Holy Spirit. So today I want to talk to you about impartation, as I talked about at the top of the program. So this Spirit Church study is going to be dedicated to three different types of impartation that the believer can participate in. So when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I was very hungry for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as I had often told you before, I would go from churches to churches. And I mean, granted, I was grounded in one specific home church, but still I was very hungry to receive everything that God had for me. So anytime there was a conference, a church service, a miracle service, I would go and I would receive. Man, I would take notes. I would read books. I was the one sitting on the front row trying to stand out to the prophet so he'd give him a word. And that was really my, my pursuit of everything that God had for me. Now, when I was about 14 years old, I was sitting in a church service in Whittier, California, 
and my friend, Prophet Robert Sanchez, who many of you know from this program, but this is before Prophet Rob and I knew each other. So I'm sitting in the service, I'm, I'm watching, I'm engaged, I'm watching the Prophet give words to different people, and it looked as though people were just having complete breaks. I mean, you could tell by the looks on their faces, the tears streaming down their faces, that God was really getting a hold and making some transformative work in them. And so the Prophet calls me out, and he stands me up, and I'm, I'm like ready to receive from God. I'm like, okay, Lord, whatever this prophet says, I'm going to believe it's from you. I'm going to receive the word. And as many of you know, Prophet Rob is a gifted prophet of the Lord. So he starts to prophesy over me. And the first thing he told me um, surprised me because I didn't know that a prophet could be so specific with his words of knowledge. The first thing he says, uh, because I had a friend from school who was actually sitting right by me, so I think it was more for my friend next to me. But he, he said, you're the type of kid and I see that you don't even have to study for your test, but you ace them and upset everybody in the class who was studying. And my friend elbowed me and said, oh my gosh, that's you. And I said, I know, how did, he, how did he know that? And so he starts saying all these other things very specific to my personality. And then he told me something that really stood out in my mind because it was a visualization of the spiritual realm. He began to talk about how bees pollinate and they go from flower to flower. And he began to talk about the concept of cross-pollination. And at that age, 14 years old, is when I received one of the first impactful prophetic words in my life. And the prophet told me, he said, you're going to be the type of ministry that is cross-pollinated. In other words, you're going to receive from various types of other ministries, and God's going to make a hybrid out of all of them, and it's going to be created in one ministry. And so I found that to be true. And the truth is that not only does everybody you'll ever meet know something that you don't know, but every believer that you meet most likely has developed some character trait of Christ further than you. Whereas some people might be more developed in their humility, others might be more developed in their peace or in their joy or in their love for others or in their ability to show mercy. And these character traits within one another are the perfecting of Christ. And it is all of us together that come together as the collective believer that we begin to cross-pollinate. We begin to impart one to another, and we start to rub off on each other. So, whereas I might need help in, in doubt and faith, I'll run into a believer who needs help in doubt and faith. And maybe I might be able to help them with humility, and vice versa. So, we have to recognize that when you receive from all kinds of anointings, not just receiving from someone who's more anointed than you are, which there are levels to the anointing. The Scripture teaches that you can grow in the anointing, and anything in which you can grow has levels to it. Otherwise, there's no room for growth. So we have to acknowledge, first of all, in humility, that some people are further along on their spiritual journey than we are. So I, I think of people like Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, Jesus and the disciples, and I talk about this type of receiving faith that's able to create within you a hybrid of those around you. At, the, at that very young age of 14, once I received that prophetic word, I was very determined and I told myself, I'm going, to, I'm going to observe and listen to the fiercely intellectual, the deeply spiritual, the those who carry holy integrity, those who have a mind for teaching, those who have a gift for evangelism, those who have a grace for the prophetic anointing, those who have the miraculous workings of miracles in their ministry. I'm going to pay attention to each and every one of those, and I'm going to do my best to glean from the best in every ministry and therefore, in my own life, see an increase in the anointing. And this is God's plan for the generations. God is not just a multicultural, multiracial God. He's a multi-generational God. And anything He does is all about the passing of His glory from one generation to the next. And the closer you get to the end-time generation, the more perfected the church has become. This is why I believe that every generation of believers is to, in fact, be more anointed than the generation before them. Be more powerful than the generation before them. Be more influential. And all of those other positive qualities that we seek to acquire in the church world. I think that with every generation, those things should grow. So this type of impartation that I'm talking about, there are three kinds of it. And I'm going to talk to you real quickly about the first two. And then I want to spend a little bit more of my time on the third because I think it's the most um, insightful that at least I found in the scripture anyway. So number one, the first kind of impartation that there is, number one, it's given impartation. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 says this, and this is Jesus talking. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now Jesus is giving this command, not just to those disciples who were hearing this when he spoke it, but he offers that command to you today. Every believer has an obligation and a spiritual responsibility to disciple his fellow man, to disciple his fellow believer. So you may say, well, I'm not really that far along in my walk, or I'm not really that advanced, or I'm not really that anointed or gifted. 
The truth is that within you, God has deposited something of value. Maybe you're just saved, just born again. And while I do acknowledge that the scripture, such as in Timothy, gives us qualities and traits to which we are to aspire if we're going to be meeting the standards of a church leader, there is also a participation that every believer can have in world evangelism, in world discipleship, no matter where they are on the spectrum of spiritual growth. So maybe you have come to a place in your spiritual walk with God where you just got saved. That's okay. Now you know Jesus as Savior. And you can help guide those who've yet to come to Christ. The moment you receive Christ as Savior, you are qualified to evangelize your loved ones. So don't ever, don't ever just get discouraged and tell yourself you're not gifted in those areas because as long as you're further along than somebody else, you can help them get to where you are now, even if it's just one step ahead. So every believer has this responsibility to make disciples. You say, okay, well, I'm saved. Well, therefore, you know Christ as Savior. So you can communicate the saving grace of Christ to the person who comes after you. So every single one of us are to participate in given impartation. Now you notice Jesus says disciples. He does not talk about memberships. You're not, your job is not to go and solicit for your church, though I believe in outreaching and inviting people to church because that's the greatest evangelistic tool in the world, the local church. I myself am a part of a local church and I'm planted under a pastor. But when it comes to this type of teaching, you have to understand that membership is very different than discipleship. Everything that God does, you look at the plant life, you look at the fish, you look at man, you look at molecules, you look at cells, everything that he does is about multiplication. And so God's plan, his agenda for the ages, as it goes with world evangelism, is multiplication. This is why the enemy's primary plan is division, because nothing destroys multiplication faster than division. And so we see here that members are a matter of addition, but disciples are a matter of multiplication. Membership is addition, discipleship is multiplication. Why? Because only true followers of Christ can reproduce. If I look at a flower or a plant that was created out of plastic, it may look and feel like the real thing. They even have some technology nowadays where they can give it the scent of an actual plant. The problem is that that plastic plant will never be real because it can never truly reproduce. So you can always tell the authentic believer by the fact that they're able to reproduce themselves. This is the act of discipleship. You are to teach and everyone can teach because every one of us knows something about the Lord. You are to live as an example. And it is that teaching and living that creates the impartation of giving. So when you're giving an impartation, you're helping those around you. So again, I want to emphasize, no matter where you are on the spectrum of spiritual growth, God has called you to impart something to someone somewhere. Number two, shared impartation. So we just talked about number one, given impartation. Number two is shared impartation. This is talking about fellowship. And the truth is that all of us can impart to someone below us. And I mean that as it goes to spiritual growth. I don't mean in value. And all of us can share in impartation because many of us are on the same path of growth in our Christian lives. And we can share in impartation. This one is very important because it has to do with fellowship. So before I get into talking about shared impartation, I want to emphasize this point is that just as you can impart good things, you can also impart negative things. There is such a thing as ungodly impartation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says this, Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company corrupts good character. So this ungodly impartation comes not when we're spending time with sinners, for Jesus himself spent time with the lowliest of sinners. This type of ungodly impartation comes when you allow yourself to be influenced by the others instead of being the influence in their lives. So of course we are to communicate with the lost. Of course we are to have unsafe friends. Of course we are to settle um, some time for our family who doesn't know Christ. We have to, otherwise how are we gonna reach them? You can't spread the gospel if you're quarantining it like it's a disease and like you don't wanna go out and touch anybody who doesn't have it. You have to treat the gospel as something that needs to be spread and you have to treat the ungodly with love and respect and care and honor so that you can communicate. That creates the bridge. Relationship is the greatest means of evangelism. So I'm talking about allowing others to have an influence in your life. Have you ever noticed that the same spirit comes on those who people hang out with? You, so you take a good kid who grew up in maybe a, an area of town that wasn't the best. And so this kid, by hanging out with those who are involved in gangs and violence and, and the like, 
he ends up becoming just like them. He loses that sweet, innocent spirit and starts to become angry and violent and entitled and prideful and blind and participates in the activities of the ungodly in that environment. That has to do with ungodly impartation. So we have to be careful to avoid the influence of the ungodly, not the contact with them. So this is talking about working together. Now God removes those from us who don't belong. The scripture says in Amos chapter 3, verse 3, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? 1 John chapter 2, verse 19 says, These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. This working together, this cohesiveness, this unity creates a certain power, and it causes within you a growth that you couldn't find anywhere else. You think of all the commands of Scripture about living peacefully with one another, about not gossiping about fellow church members, about giving in union with one another. You know, a lot of these commands are impossible to fulfill unless you're attending a local church. I mean, I, mean, I know some people who don't like this, but it's the truth. You need to be in a local church. All legitimate ministries are connected with a local church. So we talk about this type of impartation with sharing. It's impossible to fulfill some of those commands unless you're plugged into a church. So the writers of the epistles are already working on the assumption that their readers know they're supposed to be in a church anyway. So it's a very solid case there. But it is when we share in this impartation with one another that we can grow. And maybe you found yourself disconnecting from certain groups. And I'm not talking about leaving in bitterness and unforgiveness. I'm talking about being directed by God to another place in another ministry in another church. That happens sometimes. I know most pastors want to pretend like everyone who gets saved in the church needs to stay there for the rest of their lives. It's just not biblical. The truth is that God has called you somewhere. And as long as your heart is not filled with bitterness, as long as you are honestly following the leading of the Holy Spirit, you should have no worries about this. But God will bring you to a certain stream in which you'll have influence. I know I myself am attracted to certain ministries that emphasize the supernatural. I receive my impartation. If I said the name of the people that imparted into me, whether from close relationship or from a distance, you would know their names. But I'm not trying to, that's not my main point, so I'm not going to name the names. My point is that God's going to bring you around certain people who share in a similar spirit and carry similar giftings so that you can participate in a similar goal to reach people for Christ. In God's great river of ministries, there are many streams in God's great river. I see, you could even tell by watching it. There's a distinction, not a disconnect or a dislike, but there's a distinction between, say, for instance, the Hillsong movement and Joel Osteen's movement, which is called the Hope, the Hope Movement. And then you look at Jesus culture, then you look at uh, the TBN crowd, and then you look, I mean, there's all these different types of ministries. And there's, there's church growth ministries like um, Victory Outreach and Praise Chapel and Calvary Chapel and, and Har uh, they, I think there's another one called Harvest or something like that. And you see that. And you notice that there's different sections of the church that use certain lingo, preach in certain styles, and that's okay because we are all called to do something for Christ. And where God has placed you usually is where God wants you to receive impartation from. So this shared impartation, we must emphasize, we must embrace, and we must look for it. And we have to be humble enough to receive from each other. The scripture says, not neglecting to meet together, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17 says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. And this is one of my favorite verses that has to do with preferring one another. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Now, what is that? vain glory. You know that there are people who are competitive in ministries, that when they've identified another ministry that's similar to theirs, that they do their best to try to outdo and compete with that ministry. You see, this, the kingdom of God is not about competition. It's about complementing each other. It's about uniting for a common goal. I myself am linked with various ministries who carry a similar anointing and a similar goal because we could be more effective that way. And the body of Christ wants to see that. They don't want to see their leaders fighting each other or competing. They want to see their leaders united, humbly, in one cause, reaching out to the world and declaring the goodness of Christ. And so, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than himself. Now, that's Christ-like thinking, and it is within that, that type of mindset. It is with that kind of paradigm 
that you'll find a greater power when you unite, unite and receive impartation. For example, I work with several ministries here. You've seen it on the channel. You've seen Prophet Rob Sanchez. You've seen Ken Brown. You've seen David Harabedian. You've seen John Morgan. You've seen Dustin and Darlene Stanley. Uh, you've seen Stephen Moctezuma. We highlight his ministry quite a bit here. He's one of a really good friend of mine. And the reason we do that is because it's cross-pollination. You know, Prophet Rob and I, for years, were partnered with each other's ministries. I would send him $25 a month, and he would send me $25 a month. Now, people looking at that might say, well, that's kind of silly. Why didn't you just keep the money and save on the fees for processing? But the principle was that we were investing in one another. We were, we were demonstrating a godly principle by supporting one another. And you know, during that season that we started supporting each other's ministries, I saw in my life an increase on the clarity of the word of knowledge to where I started seeing into people's lives clearer than I had ever seen. Why? Because of my friendship with the prophet, the prophetic was sharpened and increased on my life. Likewise, and conversely, prophet Rob saw an increase in miracles, and he was, talk he was talking about people dropping their canes, coming out of wheelchairs, the type of stuff you see regularly on Encounter TV. And we began to see each other's giftings cross-pollinate. Same thing with Ken Brown. He saw the same effect of both of our giftings on him, and we saw an increase on the teaching anointing. Stephen Moctezuma, I mean, when he starts working with us, I saw an increase on my worship ministry. He saw an increase on his revelation in the Word. So this is all about cross-pollination, and it's that impartation that we must participate in. So don't get caught up in your own thing. Look for the cross-pollination. So that's number one, is given impartation. Number two is shared impartation. Number three, this is received impartation. Now this is one of my favorites because I personally benefited from this. And many of you, you can see the various ministries that have influenced me just by the way I minister. Even though I embrace my own unique sound, my own unique cadence, my own unique giftings and personality, I do reflect a lot of the other ministries from which I've received impartation. But this reminds me of Elijah. Now we know the prophet Elijah. He's a gifted prophet of God. He predicted the three-year drought. He miraculously was fed by ravens. Not many of us can say that. He, was, he challenged a widow to give of her best when she was at her lowest and she saw an increase on her life that brought her through the famine. Um, we see that he defeated the prophets of Baal. He called down fire from heaven. And so this is a very gifted man of God. So it's a very bold thing to look at a man of God God, that anointed and say, I want double what you got. Because that's what Elisha did. And in my life, I remember when I was, I think I was about 11 or 12 years old when I first was, I was flipping to Christian television. And I really do believe that was, that was one of the first moments of divine destiny I, I, can, I can explain to you. And it's not in the book, Carriers of the Glory. Not everything about my spiritual walk is in there, but just kind of the highlight points. But leading up to the point where Carriers of the Glory picks up, just a couple months before where that book picks up, I was flipping to Christian television, and I had grown in my hunger for Christ. I became fascinated with the person of Jesus, fixated on his face. I wanted to know his attributes, his nature, his thinking, his words, and I wanted to understand. And my heart's cry was simply, Lord, I want to know you more. So I'm flipping through these channels, Christian television, and don't get me wrong, I loved all the teaching, I loved all the preaching, but I, I stumbled across something unique when I suddenly came and there was this picture on my screen, this very peaceful image of people worshiping. And their hands were uplifted, their eyes were closed, there was a peace on their face and they were singing. There seemed to be a soft and gentle presence of the Holy Spirit among them and I saw almost like a breeze sweeping across the room, a refreshing of God's Holy Spirit. And as I watched and heard them worship, I could sense the presence of God. There was a sweetness to it, there was a beauty and elegance to it. And I was drawn to it, I was allured, I felt myself being pulled in as I was watching this. And with their hands uplifted, they sang songs that sounded like angels should be joining in with them because it was a heavenly tone to it. And then at the point where usually they would cut away from the worship and go right into the message, I instead saw something different. To my pleasant surprise, I saw a man standing on a platform, looking to one side, saying, what happened here? And that man over there on the other side of the platform pulled this man or woman up. He says, this woman came or this man came and she had this, this, and this and explained an ailment that she had and was completely healed. The woman was standing up there healed, rejoicing, clapping, jumping, praising, and all her family was there with her, and they were rejoicing with her. And there was a peace, there was an ecstasy, they were elated with this heavenly joy. And in that moment, I connected deeply with the images I was seeing, and I saw for the first time a glimpse into what God had for my life. And at that, at that age, 12, 11 years old, I said, Lord, I want this. And I boldly, some people would say, you can't pray that. Who do you think you are? And there are some people who will tell you today that they don't think that that can be done. But I'm telling you, you can do it. 
you can ask God for these things. And I boldly, with childlike faith, audacious bold faith, I said, God, I want a double portion of what's on that man's life. And from that day forward, things began to change. Now, how you measure a double portion, I'm not quite sure. And I don't believe it's been at that level yet, but it will be. Because of that childlike faith and that audacious boldness within me, I said, Lord, I want to believe. And that's how you need to get. You need to have, and forgive me for using the term jealousy. Let me just, on a tangent here, um, jealousy is not a sin unto itself. The root of where that jealousy comes from determines whether it's godly or ungodly. So God is jealous. He's not sinning. He, his jealousy is based on love. If your spouse cheated on you, would you not be jealous? Good, you would. And that's not a bad jealousy. That's a holy jealousy based on love. Ungodly jealousy is based on fear and insecurity. And it wasn't based on that. I fell in love with what was happening. And within me, I said, Lord, I want that. And maybe that's happening to you. Maybe you watch my stuff and you say, Lord, I want to be used. Let me, let me tell you, you can be used like that. You can receive the impartation. God can use you. I'm not special. I'm just someone who said, Lord, Here's all my nothing that I have to offer, and all that all, all I offer is my obedience, my will, my life. You do what you want with it. And he took an 11-year-old normal boy, Hispanic millennial from Southern California, with no political or religious connections, and now we see what God's done. But I don't say that to bring glory to myself, because you and I both know that it's not me. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit. And God wants to put that same hunger inside of you. Maybe within your heart you're crying out, Lord, I want to see miracles. Lord, I want to carry your presence like that. Lord, I want to teach like that. Lord, I want to influence people like that. God wants to use you. You can be bold. You can be audacious. You can claim it. You can ask it. Jesus said, ask me for anything. God wants to give you a double portion of what generations before us carried. God wants to give you more. God wants to use you in greater measures than what came before you. In fact, Jesus himself, when he imparted into his disciples, he said, you're going to do greater things. Why? Because he wants them to exceed the work he did. That's a true leader. That's true impartation. That we want to see them go further than where we went. And so... As someone who stands giving impartation, sharing impartation, I've also been one who received and is currently receiving impartation from various streams of ministry, and that hunger needs to come alive in you. The desire for the anointing. You say, Lord, I want to know you. I want you to use my life. I want you to increase your power on me. There's nothing wrong with praying that. Even Paul the Apostle says, earnestly desire to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 39. He's telling you to want it. He's telling you to seek it. He's telling you to hunger for it. And God wants to give it to you. God wants to bless you with it, but he's going to process you first. And so let's take a look at what it takes to receive impartation. God speaks to Elijah the prophet and says, go anoint the prophet Elisha. So we see 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 through 21. The scripture says this. So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field. And Elisha was plowing with the twelfth team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. How odd is that? Didn't talk to him, didn't pray for him, nothing. He just threw his cloak and walked away. Why? Because God will speak to the people who've gone before us. And they'll kind of throw out there their words, their teachings, their ministry. It's up to you to pursue it. It's up to you to catch it. It's up to you to follow up. You know, my pastor, he doesn't call me. I call him. My leaders, they don't call me, I call them. Why? Because I'm the one pursuing the impartation. So Elijah, Elijah just cast it and walks away. And now it's up to Elisha to do something. Verse 20, Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first let me go and kiss my mother, my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So he's telling him to really ponder this. If you really want in, you better think about this. You're not going to second guess this. You, as someone who's receiving, you can't second guess this. If you want, when I was 11 years old, I made a promise to God. And I've kept that promise and he's kept his. Sure, I've messed up. Sure, I failed. But the scripture says God is faithful even when we are not, for he cannot deny who he is. So the covenants you make with God are eternal and permanent. They're sealed. They're based on His goodness, not on your performance. And as long as you're willing to keep trying and keep going, you're going to reach what God had promised to give you by covenant. And so Elijah is chased after by Elisha. 
and he left the oxen standing there. Now, he's, Elijah's nicer than Jesus. Elisha says, I'm going to go say goodbye to my parents. Jesus would have told him, no, if you want to come, you come now. But Elijah is a little bit, it's not as heavy anointing as Jesus carried, so he's a little more lenient with Elisha. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went to Elijah as his assistant. So he goes, he barbecues for everybody, basically, but it's more of a sacrifice. It's something that he's doing. When you pursue the anointing, when you pursue impartation, it begins with sacrifice. It begins with giving something up. It begins with leaving all behind. Jesus said, if you're going to come after me, you've got to carry your cross and follow me. He didn't say, if you're going to come after me, you've got to be really talented. You've got to be really good at speaking. You've got to be very smooth with the way you are with people. No. If you're going to come after me, it's all or nothing. The power of God on our lives does not depend upon how gifted we are, but how surrendered we are. There's no limit to what God can do with an individual who is wholly given over to his purposes. Catherine Coleman said it very beautifully, and I mentioned this last week. God is not looking for golden vessels. He's not looking for silver vessels. He's looking for yielded vessels. And so Elisha pursues. He pursued. He ran after. He sacrificed and took the first step of faith. So to receive, but first let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at a couple other things. To receive, you have to be working. Elisha was plowing when Elijah found him. This is stewardship. This is why, listen to me, this is why impartation doesn't stay on some people. They'll go to a service, stand in a prayer line, lift their hands, get touched by the man of God, sometimes fall over, cry, weep, whatever, and they get back up, and they don't receive anything. It passed through them. It didn't pass to them. And the reason it passed through them instead of to them is because they were not a good steward of what they already have. God will not give something that is weighty to the one who cannot stand under the pressure of it. And that weightiness can only become come to be carried by someone who was processed by life and service. Elijah found Elisha working. God is not just going to come to you and, and say, come follow me and you're doing nothing. Even in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, it said, The year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated upon the, robe, the, the throne, and the train of his robe for the temple with glory. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Elijah, or Isaiah freaks out. Why? Because God just suddenly surprises him. But what was Isaiah doing? He was serving in the temple. What was King David doing? He was tending to the sheep. What was Jesus doing? He was fasting and praying. What was Elisha doing? He was plowing the ground. God is not going to pick someone who does nothing. I've heard it said very ignorantly so. People, I mean, there's been times when I try to do a project for the Lord, and I've had people, well, why is it so hard for you to get it done? I'm like, well, some things that are big to do, you, they, they're hard to do. And they said, well, if it was God, you wouldn't have to try. It would just happen, right? And I thought, oh my goodness, these people. That's ignorance. God wants to use you, yes, but if you're not acting, you're not working, you're not already doing something, then it doesn't count for stewardship, and God won't promote you to the next level. You know how I started in ministry? I started in ministry by doing the, the overhead projector for the worship. I was the song flipper is what they traditionally call them. Meaning, while well, the worship was going on, and this is before projectors, digital projectors were used in the church. I know, we're always behind on technology. So I, I got the, um, the little papers, they're translucent papers with words on them, and I would just switch out the songs. That's where I started, and I did that for like three years. And I didn't mind. I was just praying, Lord, I love you. Lord, I worship you. It wasn't until years later that I finally started preaching the gospel. But that's where my ministry started. If God finds you, he's going to find you working. Or he won't find you at all. If God's going to pick you up for use, he's going to find you being used already. You have to make yourself available. You have to serve. You have to initiate. Because God's already put out the call. Who will go for us? That goes for everybody. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Who's going to do something? So number one, you have to be working. In addition to the other things that I said. You have to sacrifice. It starts with sacrifice. You have to pursue it. And you have to be working. You also have to be a servant. You notice it says it followed him not as his co-preacher, but as assistant. Most of us, we want to jump right into it. We want to be on the platform right away. We want to be ministering. But let me tell you something. God wants to process your heart to the point where you don't want the platform anymore. And when you don't want the platform anymore, He'll give it to you. And when you don't want the recognition of men anymore, it'll come. And when you're not worried about influence in the worldly sense, you'll probably have it. 
because those things are useful tools, but God's not going to give it to somebody who's searching for their own glory. This is why the scripture says God has chosen the foolish things of the world. Why? So that no one can glory in, in the flesh, that they have to glory in God. God uses people to an extent to where only he gets the glory. He uses people that when people look at them, they go, yeah, that must be God. Otherwise, that person couldn't have done it. And those are the type of people God is looking for. So, you know, you look at this man of God, and he's followed by Elisha. He goes to serve him as an assistant. Now, I know not all men of God are completely godly. None of us are. I've had people kind of challenge me on, on, I'm very open sometimes about the people who've imparted it in my life. And people will challenge me, well, you know, this person did this, or they falsely prophesied that. And I'm thinking, you know, God uses broken vessels. I mean, someone's going to say something of you if you ever impart to anybody. But I look at impartation like eating a watermelon. You eat the watermelon, you spit out the seeds. There's some things you have to take out. I had my guest on Encounter TV, the episode Honoring the Anointing. John Morgan talked about we honor the man of God, not just the man. There's the man, and then there's the man of God. That extra of God represents their anointing. You have to honor the anointing. First Samuel chapter 3, when Samuel was called, he was called under the leadership of Eli. And talk about ungodly leadership. Even the scripture is very clear on how Eli wasn't able to hear God and some of the things he allowed in the temple. Still, Samuel received training from a man who had flaws. And we have to recognize that if we're going to receive impartation, we can't be nitpicky and call out every single flaw. Well, a Joel Osteen doesn't preach hard enough, or, or you know, you, there's all these different, or Brian, what, Brian Houston, is that his name? Brian Houston's not straight out enough about some issues, or, or Benny Hinn gave false prophecies, or Rod Parsley talks about money. I mean, all these criticisms of the men of God that are really unfounded, but you're not going to find a perfect man of God anyway. Not a woman of God or a man of God is perfect. Everyone's going to have flaws. This is why you have to learn to be a servant and humble yourself. Now, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 14. This is the larger portion of Scripture we're going to read. And I'm going to quickly make my final points. We're going to wrap this up in about five minutes. So 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 14 says this. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. So the leader is trying to tell the one who is following, stay here. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. So be quiet. I don't know why he told me quiet. Maybe he just didn't like the idea. Maybe it saddened him and he wasn't wanting to hear it from somebody else. You know, maybe those of you who are in the sports, your team loses, you don't want to hear it. It's bad news. Or so in this sense, maybe he didn't want to hear it because he didn't want to think about it until it was actually the moment for it. Or he was trying to process internally some things. Perhaps he didn't want them going after the anointing he was getting ready to take. I don't know. But whatever it is, Elijah was very persistent in following Elijah. Verse four, then Elijah said to him, stay here. Elisha, the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Verse 5, the company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master? Said, yes, he knows, so be quiet. So it's a repetition of what's happening. Verse 6, then Elisha said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Now, 50 men, verse 7 says, 50 men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Verse 10, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said, yet if you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise it will not. Verse 11, as they were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, my father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. Then he took a hold of his garment and tore it in two. Verse 13, Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank 
of the Jordan. He took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and struck the water with it. Where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah, he asked. When he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over. This is powerful. This is intense. We have to be persistent and intentional. You notice he said, I will not leave you. So number one, you have to initiate it. Number two, you have to sacrifice. Number three, be working for it. Number four, you have to be a servant. Or you have to be working when you're found doing it. And then you have to be a servant. Number five, you have to be persistent and intentional. I will not leave you. Elijah told him, go, go away. Elijah said, no, I'm going to be there. I'm going to catch what you have. This is the type of audacity that you need to pursue impartation. Then he was specifically bold. It was the next point. I want a double portion of what you have. Elijah, very rightly so, said, you've asked a difficult thing. But he still, in faith, persisted. And finally, you have to be active. You know, he says, where is the God of Elijah? He's basically saying, I'm going to do something with what I got now. He tore his old garment, got rid of that, and picked up the new one. He tore the old in, in, in sorrow, but he picked up the new in power. And so when he had crossed over, when Elijah had gone, that second portion mantle fell, that double portion mantle fell on Elisha. This is what the scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. He's telling Timothy, you stir up the gift. They can only impart it, but we got to stir it. We have to activate what has been given to us in this life. I love the words of Elisha. Where is the God of Elisha? We need that generation to cry out right now. Where is the God of Catherine Coleman? Where is the God of Oral Roberts? Where is the God of Billy Graham? That needs to be the cry of this generation. God, where is that anointing? Where is that power? Where is that alluring persuasiveness empowered by the Holy Spirit to convict the hearts of men and draw them toward Christ in repentance? Where is that grace for evangelism? Where is that grace for miracles and healing? Where are those who carry the glory in such a way that it's manifested all around them? We pick up this mantle boldly. Some say, well, you're not qualified, or who do you think you are? I'm called of God is what I am, and I'll take a double portion of what's mine. And God will find you working. God will find you serving. God will find you pursuing. So the power of impartation, given impartation, shared impartation, and received impartation. I really do feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit in this moment. I'm going to pray which, because I received many emails and texts and all that from many of you asking me to pray for God to use your life the same way. Can I tell you something? I want God to use you in the same way. And I want you to use Him in greater measures than what He's using me. That's the truth. You can ask anybody around me. That's my heart. That's why I pour out teaching week after week after week, because I want you to carry the anointing. So I want to pray with you right now. Father, in Jesus' name. Come on, stretch your hands forward in faith believing. God's going to touch you right now. You're going to sense His presence. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, for an impartation to take place. Lord, that you would ignite in us a fire and a passion to raise disciples, share in each other's anointing, and receive the impartation from those who have gone before us. Father, I pray for a holy boldness. I rebuke the lies of the enemy that mockingly ask, who do you think you are? And we cry out, we are the sons and daughters of God, ready to inherit what is heaven's and rightfully ours. The anointing does not belong to any man. It belongs to God. You don't need to go to men for it. You go to God for it. God will give you the anointing he's placed on them because it came from him originally anyway. So, Father, we thank you and we agree. And we receive all that you have for us. And I pray right now in this moment that you would so fill each and every vessel watching that they themselves would walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, let them walk into rooms and change the atmosphere wherever they go. Father, I pray that your glory would be a residue upon their lives 
that they would touch those around them. Lord, put your fire on their tongues that when they proclaim the gospel, men are drawn to repentance. Put your power in their hands that would heal the sick. Lord, place your authority on their shoulders that they would drive out devils in the name of Jesus. I pray right now that they receive this anointing in the name of Jesus. And I want you to say it if you agree. Amen, amen, amen. I'm telling you, I feel the power of God very strongly here moving and it's touching your life right now. And I believe those of you who in faith are willing to receive are receiving it. Wow. I almost don't know how to transition out of that. I'm excited for what God's going to do for you. He's going to use you. Just watch. But I do have to transition nonetheless. We want to welcome now our new Spirit Church members. There they are up on the screen. We now have over 150 members joining in the Spirit Church from all around the world. I actually believe all, all, all the continents that are inhabited anyway are represented in our Spirit Church membership. So we want to thank you if you joined us. If you'd like to know how to join Spirit Church, if you're watching this video on YouTube, a link is going to appear over my head right now. It's going to say Join Spirit Church. You click on that. It'll take you right to a form. You join in. You don't have to pay anything. You, all you'll do is receive weekly emails from us with these lessons included and a little note from me, and you'll be able to respond and interact with our ministry staff. And then you're a member of Spirit Church, and you'll join us in spirit every single week. And, you know, some of you are looking for a church right now. This might be a good church to attend transitionally. Maybe God's called you to this permanently. But either way, thank you for being a part of it. The Spirit family, we love you. We're praying for you. We thank you. Now, if you are ready to start giving now, maybe you're a member of Spirit Church. This is where you now sow your tithes and your offerings. Perhaps you're an ETV viewer or someone who's just followed our ministry from any of the various outlets that we have. You're receiving from it. You're encouraged by what we're doing. You want to help us win the loss. Go ahead, drop a seed today, one time or monthly. Help us out. One-time gifts of $10, $20, $30 count. And one-time gifts, the larger ones, $100, $500, $1,000. Those are the ones I want to challenge you to do as well because those make an even bigger impact in what we're doing. But again, everything counts. So $5, $10, $20, $30. Maybe you could do a one-time $50, $100, $1,000. And for those of you who are wanting to be monthly partners, $30, $50, $100 a month, anything that you could do monthly, even $5 a month, do it today. Don't wait for another time. Now is the time to do it. There's also going to be a link appearing overhead for that. And I want to thank you for your support. Thank you for helping us win the lost. I appreciate you. I love you. That's it for this edition of Spirit Church. I'm David Diga Hernandez. Remember, until next time, nothing is impossible with God. No matter what comes your way, no matter how tragic it may seem, no matter how deep, either we have standards or we don't. And everybody who says, well, you should be free, and they have kind of this... Absolutely.